Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Bathrobe Chat Live with Steve the Missionary. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming around. Um, the first, uh, or took a week off, so this is the first time talking to you guys in two weeks. Hope everyone's doing okay. Um, today is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot openly and kind of um, rashly and hot takey about Pope Francis. I was gone last week. I went on a trip to Peru which was uh, super legit. My mom is a high school Spanish teacher. And um, so that means that in uh, over spring break, she takes some of these high school kids to a Spanish speaking country and they have to like, you know, order food in Spanish and do these things. And uh, I came as a chaperone, which meant that I could not be on screen last week at, on Monday. Always happy to be, always happy to see Sean and Rebecca. Um, you guys, you you guys are my most most faithful watchers, and it makes me happy. Um, we uh, so we went to Peru. Uh, I saw Machu Picchu. I saw a bunch of Inca stuff. I saw some old cathedrals. I saw uh, the grave of Saint Martin of Porres. Um, so that was a great trip. I'm still recovering from it. Yesterday I slept seventeen hours. So just to give you a, um, a kind of a measure of how exhausted I was when I got back and how all kind of sick my whole family is right now. Um, you might've just heard my dad literally start coughing while I said that. So that's why I wasn't able to be here last week. I, I did a lot of I will be editing those into a series of, of videos about travel, about pilgrimage, about um, history. And they will first go on as exclusive content on the Patreon page. And then sometime after the Easter season, or at least after Easter Sunday, I, they will go on as um, they'll get filtered into my regular posting uh, online. But if you want them first, you have to join the Patreon. So that's patreon.com slash Steve TM. Um, almost any level of giving and donating will get you in access to that uh, Patreon page where you can get exclusive content like the trip to Peru. Um, the, uh, there was a time difference, uh, but it was only like two hours between here and Peru. I just got back because I was so exhausted, and that's why I slept 17 hours. Uh, we were going really, real hard, lots of hiking, lots of stuff at altitude. Um, Cusco, the town you kind of base yourself out of when you're up there, is at 11,000 feet. Um, so that's almost four, well, three and a half thousand meters high. So pretty intense. And um, I'm still not recovered from that 100%. <laughs> um, and the one thing that I'm really mad about is while I was out of town and not paying a, uh, too much attention to the internet, not really paying attention too much attention to work or the words that come out of my mouth, apparently. Uh, Pope Francis decided to drop his new apostolic exhortation, which is a huge deal. Um, this is called Christus Vivit, which is Latin for uh, Christ lives, or I'm going to try to get the exact translation. It's either Christ lives or Christ um, is alive, and it's not scrolling right. Uh, Christ is alive, Christus Vivit. Uh, that's the um, apostolic exhortation that he just uh, finished. And so that means that before that had to happen, there was a final document given to him by the bishops. Um, and before that final document happened, there was an entire synod on young adults, the faith, and discernment. And before that happened, there was a whole preparatory process, which lasted, I think, over a year, um, which included um, a pre-synod meeting and a document that was um, created by um, young adult kind of representatives from around the world. So this has been over a year in the making, and I have been eagerly awaiting for it to happen. And when it actually happened, I was on vacation uh, chaperoning a bunch of teenagers up and down the mountains of Peru. So a little mad that Pope Francis scheduled it that way, but here we are. And today I just read it. Uh, so today I just read Christus Vivit, um, the post-synodal apostolic exhortation of the Holy Father Francis. <coughs> 
to young people and the entire people of God. And I want to go through um, just what I thought of it, some of the the hot takes, some of my favorite um, quotes that he was pushing, um, pushing, some of the quotes that he uh, was putting out there, um, of which I have plenty. And give me your thoughts on and reactions of what I've what I've been talking about. Uh, who else is joining us? Ashley and Shaggy have joined us. So I love it because these are generally opinionated people. So we're gonna we're gonna have fun today. So first thing is um uh first um it opens with uh this exhortation opens with kind of um <laughs> extolling us um to not despise youthful people and for uh youthful people to not waste their youth uh this is a very strange document uh, to my life and to me um when they, when they say the youth the young people they specifically defined it as people who between the ages of 16 and 29 and because of that um during the process of the synod, I was 29 years old, and I was watching this as something that directly affected me. And then in between all the preparatory stuff and the actual publishing of the document, I turned 30 and therefore became someone who was kind of watching this as an outsider. This is no longer a document addressed to me as a youth. This is a document addressed to me as um, a member of the people of God who need to help the youth. And that happened during this process, which is extremely strange uh, and a really weird place to read the document from. But the first uh, big chunk of the document is about telling people how good it is that youthfulness is a part of the church uh, youthfulness is a part of us as a people, as just a collection of people. There is a chunk of us who are young. Youthfulness is a part of Christ's identity. He was someone who was young, uh, who spent a good amount of time being a young person. Uh, um, actually, you know, he died at 33. So like a massive percentage of his life was him being an adolescent. Um, and says things like Jesus is eternally young. The church is in constantly in a process of becoming young again. The Bible tells us not to despise our youth. Um, every young person feels called to a mission um, and wants to hear from God. You are my beloved child. Um, and then using that as a um, using Jesus as a model of youth. So this is something that he quoted from himself in Amor Satizia. He said, Jesus did not grow up in a narrow and stifling relationship with Mary and Joseph, but readily interacted with the wider family, the relatives of his parents and their friends. And this is both like one of the cool things and one of the... Um, Joe was making fun of me. <laughs> uh, this is both one of the cool things and one of the annoying things about the document. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of quoting other documents. Um, he will quote himself. He will quote himself in um, exhortations and uh, and encyclicals that he's written. He will quote himself in uh, homilies he's given, especially World Youth Day homilies he's given. And then he will go ahead and quote other uh, documents by popes and documents by bishops' conferences across the world. He even quoted Sons and Daughters of the Light from the United States, which isn't that big a deal of a document, and now it's like papal. But here we are. Um, oh my gosh, Natasha just told me that my goddaughter is watching, and I'm so excited. And I need to tell you, I just bought her her birthday present in Peru. So... You just warmed my heart. Mm, thank you. Um, anyway, back to Pope Francis. The um, the so what he did was he it really just feels like a compilation of all the World Youth Day homilies he's given in the last what ten years, and that's weird. It just it feels odd. Ten. Um, it's I it, everything else that Pope Francis writes. It feels like it really comes from him. Um, he's like, he sat down and from his heart, he said something to a specific group of people. This time though, there's like 
there's almost like, you know how when you write a term paper and you start way too late, so you just end up using giant block quotes to, to fill up your page count? It felt like that reading this document. Pope Francis, I, I think what he was trying to do was make it look um, synthesized and um, synodal, like he was pulling from a bunch of different voices that we have already heard. But what it felt like was a cobbling together of quotes and not a letter from the Pope to the people, which is extremely unfortunate. That's what, that's just the vibe that I received reading the letter, um, which again, I sped read today, but that's what, that's what I was really receiving. And, and so like this giant quote from um, Amoris Letizia, which is beautiful, um, kind of exemplifies. He also uses a couple of times the word um, synod, uh, synodal, I think is how you pronounce it, and um, the, which comes from the Greek synodia. Um, and because that was such a big topic in the in the meeting, in the big bishop's synod uh, that happened that kind of spurred this document. And the bishops were trying to throw that word around a lot and trying to make it mean a lot of things at the same time. And, and in a lot of ways, we're trying to mean, uh, make it mean a lot of things in terms of development of doctrine. Um, those are big words. Let me try to um, un untangle that. Um, a lot of bishops were trying to push an idea of synodality. Um, a lot of people coming together and not just not just the teachers of the faith, the bishops or like the theologians or catechists of the faith. Um, and through this conversation of of all of these people coming up with uh, what the church teaches, they would modality. And there was a whole um, argument and conversation um, about one, whether that's a thing, two, how much of a thing it is, and three, whether or not that's just a backdoor way to get heresy into the church. So um, this became a very strange conversation, and it kind of, for a minute there, overtook the conversation about young people, the faith, and discernment, which is what the synod was about. So when Pope Francis mentions synodia, synodality, um, the synod, they uh he he really boils it down to like the very basic which um which the greek means community on a journey a group of people walking together and so his first mention of synodia synodality is when he's talking about the holy family leaving jerusalem um when they walk away from jerusalem and they don't know yet that jesus is still in the temple they are a synod um and when they go back they're a synod as well um, the, they are a group of people on a journey together to the point that Joseph and Mary trust that Jesus is safe if he's just running around among the group. Uh, and so he's having fun with the word synod in a completely different way than the bishops were having fun with the word synod. And I like it because Pope Francis kind of dodges all the dodgy parts of the conversation by reminding us of what the word means at its very basic, which is tons of fun. Um, if, uh, and I like, I like subverting people that are trying to cause a ruckus in the wrong kind of way. So points to Pope Francis for that. Um, and this was very interesting to me. Youth is more than simply a period of time. It is a state of mind. This is why an institution as ancient as the church can experience renewal and return to youth at different points in her age old history. Let us ask the Lord to free the church from those who would make her grow old, encase her in the past, hold her back, or keep her at a standstill. Also ask him to free her from another temptation, that of thinking she is young because she accepts everything the world offers her. The um, really the running theme in the whole document is a contrast between being authentically youthful, um, authentically youthful in um, having the energy to keep moving, um, having the willingness to risk, uh, having kind of the resilience to bounce back and the humility to go before God, all of those things packed together kind of create, um, a youthfulness in its most um, authentic, pure God given sense. And the church needs to constantly be young, um, in that sense, 
And even, even though she is ever ancient, she needs to be also ever new. And so the two temptations to either be stalwart and old and dusty, um, or to be trendy and sexy, uh, are, are, these are the two, um, extremes that we need to walk in the middle of. And it's really great to see Pope Francis noticing those two and calling them out very specifically. Um, and then something that was a lot of fun. I'm going to be thinking about for a while, even, even if the church possesses the truth of the gospel, this does not mean that she has completely understood it. Rather, she is called to keep growing in her grasp of that inexhaustible treasure. And this is why the church can learn from people who are not Christians um, or better stated Christians can learn from people who are not Christians because though the church possesses the truth, we carry it. It is ours. We don't fully understand it. And so we need our time and thought and interaction and encounter in the world to help us um, break it open, understand it. And that's important if we want to be a missionary church, that's going to be a lot of fun. It might get him in trouble with some traditionally minded people, but also it's an important distinction to make. Um, and he does claim the church possesses the, the truth of the gospel. Um, but there are plenty of times when we as a collective people, the church, do not understand it. Um, uh, um, I'm scrolling literally down um, this whole thing. Then he goes into a lot of the problems of youth. And he specifically says... Um, uh, youth does not exist, which I love. Indeed, youth does not exist, saying that a, the category of young folk isn't a thing. Uh, there are people of, 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 of an age bracket, and they live all across the world, and they have entirely varying experiences, uh, entirely varying um, category of what's needed immediately and what, and what can hold on for a while. And this is very important to know. So he's really giving a, a, a good proper hat tip to um, the varying needs of young people across the world. And so these things include um, closeness, mutual assistance, um, the ability to weep for the suffering of others, fighting ideological uh, coloni colonization, uh, which is a very touchy subject when you're talking about Christianity, especially when you're talking about Christianity from people who are um, uh, of European descent. Um, and I'm going to leave that there while I read some of your comments. Um, Ashley, the quotes I'm seeing online remind me a lot of the themes that God is young. Haven't finished with the new document, but I'll be interested to see how many of the talking points are repeated. A lot are repeated. It, a lot. It, there's a lot of repetition in this document. It got a little old. Rebecca retracted a message. Um, um, Shaggy at making fun that traditionally minded people are constantly trying to get Pope Francis in trouble, which is true. So <laughs> back to what we're talking about. Um, a couple, the first thing that really kind of blew my mind, um, and that is sometimes adults fail or do not even try to hand on the basic values of life, or they try to imitate young people and thus inverting the relationship between generations. Um, Ashley reminded me that sometimes the, there's an inversion of relationship between generations in a more natural sense in that um, adults get sick uh, or parents get sick and children need to take care of them. Uh, that can be much more strained, but usually most of the time, at least later in life, that's a common kind of flip. But this is really talking about a young people in the sense of like 19 year olds who old people are trying to copy. Um, and imitate and learn from, and which is literally the switch of what is supposed to happen. And we see it a lot where the what appeals to the youth is what drives the culture. And this is part of our throwaway culture, right? The, um, is that what appeals to youth sells the most. And so that's what's going to drive the culture when it should be switched, that old people should be asked to teach the young. And uh, and the young should learn from the old. And this takes humility from both sides of this, uh, from this conversation uh, and from all of this that is happening. I, whew, I wrote down a lot. Um, 
here's something I want to ask everybody. Um, he said something interesting. Um, if you see a priest at risk because he has lost the joy of his ministry, and he means at risk of either leaving the priesthood or doing something very bad because he is isolated, um, because he has lost the joy of his ministry or seeks effective compensation. I don't know what that means. Or is taking the wrong fat path. Remind him of his commitment to God and his people. Remind him of the gospel and urge him to hold his course. My question is, is this good advice? I genuinely don't know. Uh, I'm really and entirely not sure uh, if that's good advice. Uh, so please tell me. Um, Rebecca says that sounds like most of the priests in my diocese. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh. Um, ha. Huh. Um, and then he uh goes on to kind of attack that um that culture of what did I just say that throwaway culture and saying young people you are not up for sale you are endlessly um of endless worth to God and of endless worth to us um and then he he goes to an eminently quotable are you seeking powerful emotions you will not experience them by accumulating material objects spending money chasing desperately after the things of this world they will come and in a much more beautiful and meaningful way if you let yourself be pr prompted by the holy spirit and again i don't know if that's good advice um <laughs> what does it actually say um I was thinking along the lines of immature parents, okay, uh, where the children are having to learn to be an adult and then teach their parents to do the same. You are absolutely right. Uh, you are absolutely right that this is not what's what is supposed to happen. Um, and uh, Natasha, from what I've seen, unless a good relationship with the priest, they would probably just ignore your attempt to help them. This is also true. Um, that is so would, making it not bad advice, but just extremely difficult advice to follow. Um, some poetry, I guess, from Pope Francis, a young person stands on two feet as adults do, but unlike adults whose feet are parallel, the young person always has one foot forward, ready to set out to spring ahead, always racing onward to talk about young people is to talk about promise and to talk about joy. And he says that a lot. He talks, he says young people and promise constantly made me feel like I had let him down with my own young adulthood. <laughs> That I didn't fulfill the promise that Pope Francis thought I had back when I was 29, but here we are. Um, if Be careful. When you read uh, Christus Vivit, there's a little bit of a sense that, or at least for me, that I let down my granddad. Um, and that's uh, hard to, hard to kind of let go of. Um, there's a lot about um, maturity, a lot about maturity in this. Um, but I'm, and that could be spiritual maturity, physical maturity, social maturity is, is asked for from everyone, which is an interesting thing. He wants it from the young people and from the adults. And from there, I'm going to jump to what he says about youth ministry. Um, and to a couple of my favorite things he said, one, young people themselves are the agents of youth ministry. They are the ones doing the work of youth ministry. Um, Youth ministry has to be synodal. It has to involve journeying together. Um, and it needs, above all, a language of closeness, uh, a language of the, excuse me, generous, rational, and existential love that touches the heart. He really sees youth ministry as, I guess, separate from youth catechesis. Is If you are doing a ministry, you are ministering to the needs of someone. Um, and he talks a lot about um, various attempts to talk about the moral life in youth ministry and keeps mentioning their weaknesses. And my problem is he never perfectly spells out the time of when one is supposed to just teach the facts. Uh, because, and he's not wrong. He's like, some some places do a really good job of like, giving a space for people to encounter Jesus. And when the teens do encounter Jesus, then they sit down and they just give and bullet point all of the doctrinal and moral obligations of the Christian. And that is how you stifle a flame of love. Okay, true. Uh, but then 
what and so then he'll say something like the two main goals one is the development of the kerygma um the foundational experience of encounter with god through christ's death and resurrection the other is growth in fraternal love community life and service and he really is talking about kind of creating again a a, a cultural catholicism something where you when you respond to god's love for you you do so through love of neighbor um support of the community and service to those who need it which is great and wonderful and clearly the christian life and maybe this is just a uh my background talking more than than it should but at what point do you teach the doctrine um and he he talked a little bit about excuse me <coughs> he talked a little bit about how um doctrine is presented always in the context of a re-presenting of the kerygma of the of the basic gospel message and when someone learns the basic gospel message a little bit more a little bit more deeply then the i guess repercussions that happen within doctrine and morality um kind of open themselves up to them which is true i just wish there was a more stratified way to talk about it um let's see what's going on shaggy um it's good advice we're still talking about the um the priest we are we are the sheep and the priest is the shepherd the shepherd falls asleep the the the, the sheep must keep him warm um that's adorable and if the wolf comes in the sheep must ba to wake him um essentially we're responsible for each other which is another Teresa quote essentially um yeah we belong to each other this is true and a big gist in in the document itself I think would be a major theme in what Pope Francis was saying. We belong to each other. And it's kind of funny and kind of unfortunate in terms of structuring the document. He was talking to the youth. And when you want to talk to the youth, it means you have to address all of the issues within the church because they all happen to the youth. So he randomly has to mention ecology. He randomly has to mention um, migrant people. Um, And he randomly has to mention... um, sexual morality and then he randomly has to mention a couple other things all of which kind of deserve their own exhortation (coughs) but instead they we get a handful of paragraphs about those things in the context of the youth which is it must have sucked writing this is all i'm really going to say um about that he um he he drops one on catholic schools a little bit mean on that um saying that too many uh, some Catholic schools seem to be structured only for the sake of self-preservation and how that's a bad thing. And then he said something very interesting that I want to ask you guys what you think. He says, we cannot separate spiritual from cultural formation. And I don't know how right he is. He's clearly, there's clearly plenty of ways in which he is right. Um, Catholic spirituality has always been popular uh, of the people, things that we do together. We read the Bible together. We pray the rosary together. uh, We we say the stations of the cross together. Our liturgies are together. And so, and therefore, you know, outside of the church, spirituality happens together too. Processions happen together. Um, Communities come together to feed the poor. uh, And they do so with their own cultural um, understandings, priorities, uh, <coughs> um, feelings and emphases, and this is a good thing, and and therefore, in order to um, to pass a culture down to somebody, you will pass on the spirituality to somebody um, if the culture is, I guess, has a spirituality, um, and if you were to pass on a spirituality to someone, you will be passing on a culture and it strengthens the culture. Um, a culture without a spirituality is going to die. So what I, one thing is, is there such thing as a spirituality that transcends culture that, that can be given to this culture and to that culture and that culture, or is every spirituality thoroughly enculturated and in that when you pass it down, you will pass down the culture that it came from as well. That's kind of question one. Um, and I guess question two is 
when I say that, do I really just mean like doctrine? Is truth transcendent and spirituality so subjective that it always happens within the culture? Um, so the quote is, we cannot separate spiritual from cultural formation. And my question is, how correct is he? And we got a lot of responses. Let's see who's talking. Um, uh, still talking about belonging. Um uh, Joe says, I've come around a little bit on needing to minister to young people and prepare them, the teenagers, for the message before hitting them with doctrine. I'm with you that they oftentimes end up, oft times, end up having no idea how to discuss their faith because we don't get to doctrine or even philosophy on how we talk to talk about truth. Um, Elizabeth, or sorry, Rebecca, most of the kids I've dealt with in youth industry don't even go to church on a regular basis. You can correct them all day long, but they still don't go to church. Uh, and, and that's one of the kind of a running theme in a lot of ministry is you constantly feel like you're in square one, which is um, unfortunate. And kind of why you get documents like this. It's just like, just give them the kerygma over and over again, um, which is true. But I remember my brother going to one of these big events where they just kept repeating, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And by the end of the day, he's like, if I hear the phrase, God loves you one more time, I'm going to scream like, great. God loves me. Now what? And it was kind of interesting to see that there's, there is, um, a lot of, okay, now what in this document, in ministry in general, and in youth ministry in particular. And there's a lot of, that sounds great, but I don't know if that's even possible to implement where we are. We have so many steps before that. And um, there is, pray for people in ministry just in general, because they, they it's a daunting task. Um, you're you're always or too many steps behind. Um, you always feel like you're overlooking something and you always feel like um, you are underperforming. So please pray for people in ministry. Um, and and then he talks about something called popular, I'm going to last two bits, popular youth ministry and then uh, vocational discernment. Um, and he says, and he always puts it in quotations, popular youth ministry, popular leadership, not um, youth ministry that appeals to the most people and is cool or leaders who are the most popular people, but youth ministry and youth leadership that is of the people, that is of the populus, popular. And so that means that there is youth ministry that happens in the youth room. And he specifically says, we need spaces that youth can come and go as they please and feel comfortable. It's kind of funny. He calls specifically for youth rooms. And there is that. But then there is also the ministry that the people in general do to the youth and for the youth. And we need much, much more of that. And we need the leadership of, of, the, of the movement to help the youth to be in the same way, to be a collective calling from the people as a whole in how we're going to help the youth and the youth as a whole. <coughs> I know of a church in Oakland diocese that um, instead of service hours and like documenting the service hours, they, they pair off their teenagers with essentially a mentor in one of the ministries of the church. So maybe it's the St. Vincent de Paul Society, maybe it's the Lectors, maybe it's the Knights of Columbus, any of the any of the places that ministry is done or service is done in the church, um, a teenager is kind of paired off with someone within that group. And that person kind of trains them. This is what we do. This is when our meetings are. You should come. All right, this is how, this is, this is who you need to talk to to accomplish this. This is how you do all this. And so... They are brought into the life of the church. They become very regular, prominent, and important, effective members of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, the Knights of Columbus, the, the Altar Society, the lectors, um, anything you want to talk about in that church. And so instead of creating a, a, a little pocket in the church where a teenager can do service and then leave once they are confirmed or once they graduate high school, they create a structure in the church 
that they have burrowed a home in and they can always return to if they happen to leave town for any amount of time. That is so much stronger. That is that is leadership and ministry in a popular sense, that of the people. And I think that Pope Francis is trying to point out that models like this need to be added to the teaching elements of youth ministry because otherwise you you have a very um, easily forgotten experience in the church, an unrooted experience in the church. Pope Francis talks a lot about the need to be rooted and um, the temptation that young people have and the temptation that uh, parishes have to uh, make sure that the youth are not rooted. And so they will leave and they will, and, and it hurts to, to be unrooted is a very, uh, a very hurtful thing, um, which is, um, you know, something we should fight, something Pope Francis is fighting a lot. And um, finally, he gets to discernment. Uh, he talks about the road to Emmaus, which I'm a little over, honestly. I probably shouldn't be, but here we are. Um, he says, don't let yourselves be robbed of a great love. Don't let yourselves be led astray by those who would propose a life of rampant individualism that in the end leads to isolation and the worst sort of loneliness. Never completely bury a calling. Never accept defeat. Keep seeking at least partial or imperfect ways to live what you have discerned to be your real calling. Um, and then my favorite, God's gifts are interactive. To enjoy them, we have to be ready to take risks. Uh, and then he compares discernment to spiritual combat. This is both beautiful and I'm not sure how to take it. Because he really does compare he, the word vocation, which historically has carried a lot of very specific weight in the Catholic world, to literally mean the way you live your life is a calling. Your job can be a vocation and really says your job is a vocation as long as you live it out in a sense of calling. And that's why he says, like, if you have a, a promise that you feel you need to fulfill a calling that you have, but you can't get it right now because you got sick, because you just can't get that job, because you just can't move to that town, he responds with never completely bury a calling and never accept defeat. Um, keeping, keep seeking at least partial or imperfect ways to live what you have discerned to be your real calling. That seems like a recipe for burnout um for uh, like for never being fulfilled in this life even if you're attempting to live your calling when he said that living your calling is how you will feel fulfilled in this life earlier in the document maybe and like here's the problem um this part of the document is rubbing up against all of the parts that my heart has been hardened. So I'm going to be the most resistant to stuff like this. So I'm going to, but um, there's probably a lot of good in there and I need other people to help me see the good. So that's, that's what I have to say is a lot of this talk about vocation in this document is stuff I'm used to because I went to a Jesuit university, but also is beautiful and intense and, full of promise, but also seems to be a way to um, really become weary of the world and weary of your own spiritual needs and realities without ever achieving what is being promised. Um, and that's kind of be the last thing I say is, um, and yeah, Ashley's right. This is bad for my stubborn streak, but it somehow sounds encouraging. I would really encourage everybody to read the last bit about vocation. And you tell me, is this actually true or is this falsely encouraging? And uh, with that, I'm going to end uh, end the stream. Um, please check out the video. Um, please uh, check out the pa Patreon, patreon.com slash stevetm, especially if you are looking for uh, exclusive content to come out of my trip to Peru. And I will see you guys for the rest of the week. I'm posting daily videos and I will see you on a live video next week, which uh, might be Holy Week already. 
I forget. Um, the end of Lent is coming up fast. So um, pray for me. I will be praying for you. The podcast, or the podcast, the vlog has ended. Go in peace.